It was almost time for the final whistle when the 15,000 odd employees of Avro and Arenda were told not to return. These men had taken a natural pride in producing the Arrow, undoubtedly the greatest achievement in Canadian aviation. like this. There. Like that. Like who in the heck would in his right mind would ever try something like this? Was it a lemon? Was it a dog? I don't know. It's part of the mystery of this whole thing. We knew that we needed an arrow. When I was a kid, of course, I had a Ravel model of the arrow. Well, I got this silly idea about 1989 and started to doodle and uh, made an intake as a test um, item to see how tough this would be. It's not like I'm saying I saw Elvis Presley. Once we had a full-scale model, um, I knew the film was going to be done. If I can build a left, I can build a right. So I built a right. The story of the arrow is about the ability to fulfill your dreams. It is by any standards a dream cast. I'm just uh, thrilled by the cast on this film. I needed to find a star and I wanted to find a Canadian star because it's a Canadian story and I did not want to put a foreign star in that part. And so I started looking at my cast of characters trying to determine the best place to put, to put a star and Dan Aykroyd came to mind right from the beginning. Uh, there was a photograph in Greg Stewart's book, Shutting Down the National Dream, of Crawford Gordon on the day of the rollout in his sunglasses, and I saw it and I immediately thought of Dan. Keith wrote a very passionate, very eloquent letter to Dan, and I imposed on a friend of a friend to get the letter to Dan. Um, he gave us an address, a personal mailbox number. We sent the letter to Dan, and I just dropped it in the mailbox with my fingers crossed. And about 10 days later, I was out in the backyard gardening and the phone rang. I went in and picked up the phone and, hi, this is Dan Aykroyd. Is Keith Lackey there, please? I was there for, you know, the news of its, its flight and the news of its triumph. And, uh, of course, after it went away, it was all sort of buried and covered up. And I didn't really know about its demise too much until, really, I read Keith Lackey's script. Dan asked about Crawford's father. And uh, it was, it was I, I could tell that he was very interested in the character. But he was a go-getter. My mother knew him, and he said he was a, a guy who just knew what he wanted and went, and went and got it. You've been spreading lies about my airplane. Well, I will tell you this, that when the all-Canadian arrow flies and breaks all the world records, you and your cronies will be exposed for just who you are, a bunch of fools and liars. Get out! I think it's some of the most satisfying work I've done since Driving Miss Daisy or My Girl. It's good, really good, solid, dramatic work, and uh, I was, and I'm happy to be involved. For me and for, I think, the, the women in the audience, Kate is going to be our way into the story. You want to go to Sudbury. You switch to auto, feed in the coordinates, set the throttle and Mach number. You're in Sudbury in nine minutes. And when you get there, you better know where you're going next because while you're making up your mind, you're going to be out over the Arctic Ocean. This isn't going to be like any other fighter plane, Mr. Woodman. This is going to be a rocket ship. You have to be thinking 30 miles ahead of her all the time to stay in control. No seat of the pants prop jock stuff is going to cut it here. You need to know her inside out. Every system, every control mechanism, every nut and bolt. Or else, she's going to fly you. This is a woman who lived in the 50s, had four children, worked full-time as an aeronautical engineer, um, was part of this incredible team of engineers developing this plane, and, jug and was a single parent, and jungled all of these things, and it was very unusual at the time. Jack figures uh, throughout the script. He's a wonderful character, he's, uh, as a little loose as any test pilot would be, uh, considering the crazy nature of their profession but he's a completely dedicated, uh, committed person. So it's three against one. I'm at my ceiling, guns are all jammed. Uh, I'm all but out of fuel. 
so there's no other place to go but down. So I put it into a steep dive, full throttle, and I always get away from it, too. Except for one little problem, I blacked out. So I wake up at 2,000 feet, still headed for terra firma. I pull her out, engine sputtering, scraping the treetops, and there, right in front of me, is an airfield. All the way down the line, uh, from the, the everyday performers, are, are fabulous. Uh, I'm real excited by that. And then, and then you have the cameo parts. The price per plane has skyrocketed to 12 million. <laughs> I'm afraid, uh, as pretty as it is, we've got ourselves a lemon. President Eisenhower has assured the United Nations there is no high-altitude American spy plane. I can only hope it's because he doesn't know. Are you going to brief me on the program or not? I can't help you, Colonel. If you don't, we'll have to install them ourselves, just south of your border. But then those planes would be shot down over our cities. Think about it, John. I'm pretty sure that the missile option would be best for both of I like that sense of you can reassure him. Great. All right, yeah. Okay, let's just try one more. Excellent. The main technical challenges are things like we're trying to create uh, a, a lot of, uh, of action around uh, planes and rockets and things like that where we just don't have the wherewithal to actually do it. So, a fair amount of smoke and mirrors. This is a model we used uh, during the opening sequence of the hour. It's an old CF-100. Uh, we used a small model like this because we spent all the money on the big model of the Arrow. So the shots of the uh, CF-100 were, you know, we deliberately, uh, you know, sort of didn't use quite as many resources on them. Anyway, the idea behind this one is that this one was mounted on a, uh, on a rotational motor, which was in turn mounted on another set of rotational motors and allowed us to effectively move the plane like this, and like this, and like this. So pitch, yaw, and roll. Right. Then the camera would effectively be moved towards this as though this was flying towards the camera, and you could create the idea that this is flying at the camera. This was used in the very first uh, effects shot of the movie, and I can, I can show you that on the computer. Zoom, smoke pass, okay. This is something that I took into the warper and warped. Whoosh. So now it, it follows the trail that the plane's gonna fly. Uh, it comes by the tower in a really fast sort of We were lucky enough uh, through the network of arrowheads and arrow enthusiasts, uh, but ultimately through the internet, we found Alan Jackson, a man just living just outside of Edmonton who happened to be building an arrow, had been working on it for six years and expected to have it done by the year 2000. And he was an engineer and a very capable craftsman who had built the, uh, the nose cone and cockpit and uh, done a beautiful job on that, and a framework, and the wing sections, and the undercarriage, which was um, uh, quite a feat for him to do in his garage, in his backyard. And they built a, a beautiful undercarriage and framework for the arrow. So this uh, and, and the wing sections uh, were ready to be covered. He was just waiting for the, uh, actually, he was saving up money to buy aluminum, laminated aluminum, that he could uh, that he could finish this thing. So we leased it from him and trucked it to Winnipeg on three trucks and started to build it here. The third technique we used was radio-controlled models. We had these uh, radio-controlled enthusiasts who were also arrow enthusiasts, and they were hired on to make the radio-controlled craft fly. And they were effectively re-engineering the arrow. They would you know, they'd go through some of the old documentation that they would dig up and they would discover things about it. You actually really have to build a craft that really does truly fly. And uh, that, that for me was probably the most interesting part of the process. Raining. Just a little sprinkle off.
don't know. Doesn't look good at the moment. The wheels are somewhere down here. Oh, the pin break? Yeah. Yeah, the, the safety pin broke. Yeah. I had to lift to be able to turn to get back down away from the building. And they're going to fix the uh, CF100 and they're going to fly that. That's the reason the engine quit. It's like a cylinder. Wow. Really Jet craft are, are very difficult to do in radio control. We're effectively making the legend of the arrow. That's a sensitive issue. Why not? Don't mention the wings. They didn't build the full-scale model with, with uh, titanium beams in it like they did the real arrow. They instead they used pipe steel and plywood. It's a hell of a lot heavier. Uh, so the wings sagged on the tips. Over here, you see the problem with the wing. Right? It's a little bit bent. So Joel cuts it out and uh, basically can straighten it and reattach it digitally. And the idea is to add uh, a bunch of arrows going off the distance make the whole building seem bigger, raise the roof, uh, you know, create a whole production line out of it. Yeah, I guess it was February the 20th, something like that, that Black Friday in 1959. I can remember going through the bays again on some mission and hearing Crawford Gordon's voice, our president, coming over the loudspeaker telling us that it was over. We were all uh, terminated or laid off. And uh, uh, that, that, that was something, at that moment, everybody was galvanized. And so 10,000 people were laid off in 20 minutes. My God, who wants to hear this story? We've, we've shot ourselves in the foot in so many ways. Maybe the era was an innocent victim of power politics that were going on at a level beyond our, our knowledge. We just thought we were building a beautiful plane. Couldn't they save one for a mu museum or one for aerospace research? They were all destroyed, all models, blueprints. They were sawn up, cut up and given to uh, a dealer for scrap which uh, to me is the, the real black part of the story. I mean whatever the politics of the and the finances were, wh wh whether it was uh, way too expensive and it was a good political move in terms of that, a good economic move, that aside 
what would possess them to go in and destroy all that amazing work? Well, I'll always remember, and it's, an, it's nightmare stuff, the smell of acetylene torches in those bays as those aircraft, those beautiful dreams, were cut up into little pieces. One interesting thing is Diefenbaker did, about 18 months after the cancellation, say, gee, maybe, maybe this was all a mistake. And that, was very, that comment was very classified for, for 30 years. Ultimately, yes, there are tragic tones to it, but we are dreamers and we believe that the Arrow was a brilliant plane and we also believe that someplace, somewhere, that dream is still alive. So you have a model, then you have to shoot that model. I gave Jeff a call and said, okay, if you are in a helicopter, Jeff, you're piloting a helicopter, we have the space cam, do you foresee the, the, the possibility that we can shoot uh, from the helicopter to uh, a radio-controlled model flying at a safe distance um, behind us, below us, above us, around us? Jeff scratched his head a bit. Looks like he's going real fast downwind. I don't know if we had that kind of speed in the helicopter. What do you think, Jeff? Yeah, no, we should be able to hang in there with it. We we'll just make the turns really wide. Theoretically, um, it seems like it's possible. In this case, it's a little more tricky because there's no pilot in the little aircraft, um, and so the, uh, the the pilot for the RC uh, hangar will be uh, in the helicopter as well, uh, running the remote, uh, flying it by remote control. And uh, so we, which I don't think has happened very often, uh, if at all. The first time we shot these in Gimli, we didn't get any arrow material. Should we spend more money and go out and try it again? Is it worth it? There were some long meetings over that. It was decided that yes, we'd give it one more try. Doug spent months building these things, he was slaving over them, sanding them, and he never got to fly them. And we had these two other pilots, and they would just go out and, and effectively crash them and send them back to him, and he would repair them. Well, we rotated the gear. He took his original design, and he looked at it, and he just went into it and tore it apart and rebuilt the whole thing. Brand new plane. This was the first time Doug was going to fly the thing, really himself. He got into the helicopter and uh, we took off and uh, Barry took, a, took the arrow off the ground. They handed controls over. Jeff pulled the helicopter right in on top of it. Doug is just sitting up there looking down through the window and the floor at you know, all of his work just sort of flying there beautifully stable in the air. And it's not really doing anything. The, the frame's all right. The Rolla was the biggest day and the most expensive day with hundreds of extras in this gorgeous aircraft. And if, if somehow it flopped, if somehow it poured rain, we just didn't have another day to do it. Their budget is extremely tight. It was a big day in terms of the production itself, but I think it really felt like a bit of a time warp. If anybody who's got an instrument, get in and get a spot over here in the band area that would make sense to the arrangement. I was so busy worrying about our 340 extras. Um, I think we had about 30 of our principals on set. It's a big movie making day. Here. Yeah, the big the, what you want to see is when the band's playing. And the big yeah. wide master, and then after that it'll be like watching hair grow or paint dry or the trucks <laughs> on the road at the end, eating it off. Our dailies, um, the sun, the weather. I didn't even think about the emotional moment. And um, as it happened, the sun broke through the clouds, the actors were in place, the camera was ready, the sound was ready, um, the playback music struck up, the curtains parted. The big moment's coming, I guess. Yeah. Oh, I gather you haven't seen this yet? After 40 years. That's his 58. Action! I now have the pleasure of unveiling the Avro Arrow. This is 
too much, you know, you guys. I went on and imagined Jan Zurakowski getting into it and flying it. There's one left somewhere. Hard to imagine where they hid it, though. Squirreled away in a, in a huge barn in Barry's Bay. I know there are people that claim that they can still hear the arrow flying in the skies, across the skies of Canada. But this was the Iroquois engine. I knew the Iroquois engine. I heard the Iroquois engine that morning, and I thought, well, one got away. <laughs> <laughs> 